Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to talk about joy. Now, that might seem a bit strange in an event which is about education, but I wanted to bring us back to what I hope is our foremost thought. If I asked you what you wanted most for your children, I hope that you wouldn't say five A star, A levels, and a job at Morgan Stanley. Well, that might be your second thought, but I hope the first would be that you want your children to be happy, to find fulfillment and joy. If your daughter grows into a confident, balanced, brave, and joyful young woman, then you and the school that you choose has done the best job in the world. So let's keep that thought in our heads. What I'm talking about is how to find joy. Now, in order to talk about joy, I have to talk about failure. And to do that, it might help if you understood my background a little. And it isn't that of a conventional head. As you've just heard, I've had multiple careers, which is something I often talk to the girls about, having multiple careers. I've been in publishing, I've been a writer, worked in property, design, marketing, counseling, and hospitality. And I only went into my teaching in my late 30s. I've got four children, two girls and two boys, and they were all brought up in rural northeast Scotland. This background forms the basis for my educational philosophy. Now, my two daughters are tomboys. Their childhood was spent swimming in lochs and climbing trees, and then with their two brothers making dens and shooting pigeons. It taught them how to cope with being cold, wet, and muddy, being hungry, having to be patient, and still having to learn about nature. And in addition, being part of a big family, they learnt how to share, how to support one another, to adhere to family rules, to take responsibility, and to be respectful. Now, school wasn't easy for them either. They all struggled to learn conventionally and had to find all sorts of tricks and strategies uh, to get them uh, through to make the progress that other children seemed to find so easy. In those days, there weren't tutors to help, and they had to fight their own way through an educational system based on exam performance. Inevitably, there were setbacks and struggles, disappointments and failures, but they never gave up. And they all did surprisingly well and are now relatively successful, happy, caring young adults. But the world of 2015, particularly here in central London, is a very different one from 10 years ago. The internet and social media have changed the landscape forever. Terrorism, pornography, paedophiles, no wonder we're called helicopter parents or snowplow parents. And that's before we even start on the competitiveness of the 11 plus and 13 plus, the fight to gain a place in a school, the pressure to tutor your child until she can't think and loses all confidence and independence. Girls tend to be fragile, brittle, low in self-esteem, anxious, obsessed with body image, riddled with performance anxiety, self-harming in a number of ways, anorexia, bulimia, cutting themselves or addicted to social media sites. What has happened to your carefree, happy daughter? Some feel that this picture is particularly worrying in some of our most academic and prestigious schools, citing the fallout for girls who feel that their worth is based on their exam grades. Perhaps your daughter manages to gain the requisite 12 A-star GCSE grades, albeit with a touch of anorexia and depression on the way. Off she goes to Oxford, the fulfillment of her dream, only to find that everyone has 12 A-stars, and down she tumbles once more into self-loathing and a fear of failure. But perhaps she manages all that. She achieves her degree and finds an internship in a top bank, only to find that they're looking for quite different attributes from the ones that she'd been told all her life were important. Because most employers are looking for emotional intelligence, problem-solving skills, flexibility, enterprise, creativity, and the ability to network and connect. Now, there really isn't a GCSE in this. If you're looking for the best school, the best school, don't ask, perhaps, what the exam results are. Ask, 
What do you do to build resilience, independence, imagination, and grit? What priority do you place on your children's well-being and mental health? How do you teach your girls to be brave, curious, modest, and loyal? What price do you set on happiness? Now, the trouble for girls starts very early on in their lives. Almost the moment they're born, girls hear the magic words, good girl. For all sorts of reasons, girls are hardwired to please, and so they instinctively look for ways which will elicit that lovely emotional stroke. They eat their food, they tidy their room, they brush their hair, and we exclaim, good girl, and even more extraordinarily, clever girl. And what are their brothers doing? Kicking a ball around, getting filthy, leaving their smelly socks on the floor, and they seldom hear the words, good boy. By and large, they couldn't give a damn. Now, while that might sound as if boys should grow up with low self-esteem and girls should be full in, of confidence, the exact opposite happens. Girls become dependent on getting things right and winning approval. So they make sure they only attempt the things that they will do well. By the time they're going through adolescence in their senior school, they're terrified about being told off. Getting attention, detention is a disaster. They're frightened of getting things wrong. At highly academic schools, this can be represented by something as minor as getting a B in an essay. Disaster, I've got a B, I'm a failure, I'm stupid. This search for approval has been made 10 times worse by the overwhelming need also to be thin and beautiful, insidiously fed by social media and its horrific culture of sharing digitally enhanced photos and selfies, which are then evaluated and graded by likes and endorsements. Girls' self-esteem can't cope with this onslaught, unlike boys who don't seek approval and peer affirmation, who enjoy banter and who can cope with being teased, girls' emotional health buckles under the need to be little Miss Perfect. So what can we do? Well, although the situation may seem dire, and admissions to hospital for mental health issues and self-harm have doubled in the last three years, we can do something. First, and most importantly, of course, <clears throat> parents can ensure that their daughter doesn't feel that their love and approval are based on her achievements, particularly her academic performance. They can ensure that they don't convey anxiety and fear about their daughter's future. They can steadfastly refuse to compare her to her sister or her friend. They can surround her with love, acceptance, fun and play. They can have adventures together and build bonding memories. Second, we must find a school where she's loved and valued for her individuality, for her particular gifts, where they're recognized and nurtured, where she's encouraged to think outside the box, take risks and learn to be brave. Now, there aren't many schools like this in London, there are more in the boarding sector, and some of the things we do at our school at Francis Holland are features that you might more readily find amongst the leafy lacrosse fields. But here are some of the initi initiatives at our school which mean death to Little Miss Perfect and welcome Maria from the Sound of Music. First, in sport. In our school, our sport has been transformed. If you want girls to understand how to fail, Encourage them to take part in competitive games. We've developed our sports program to be really successful, but not before we many times experienced the bitter taste of defeat and learnt to train and train and try again until we start to discover the joy of winning. Emphasis isn't placed on the outcome, but on the need for practice, for determination, for courage, for teamwork, for perseverance, for grit. Second, I suppose I've tried to bring a bit of Scotland into SW1. 
by establishing the Exploration Society, a program of increasingly challenging expeditions, week-long expeditions that the girls go on year by year to learn survival skills, collaboration and endurance for all the year groups culminating in a trek to the Himalayas. Third, <clears throat> we've introduced mindfulness. Every pupil and teacher is taught simple meditation techniques and the school day starts with just one minute of strong silence to steady and focus the mind and control anxiety and worry. Fourth, I'm proud that we're the first independent senior school to introduce Place to Be. The stand is over there and I think you can pick up uh, a brochure about it at the back at the end. This is a program of early intervention in mental health problems in young children. Not just reacting to a problem, but getting into the problem really early on so that we're not waiting until girls are cutting themselves or starving themselves, but destigmatizing such issues so that we can talk through their worries early on and give them the time and the tools to talk through their problems. And fifth, and there are other strategies that I don't have time to tell you about here, we challenge girls to push themselves outside their comfort zone, to take risks and even to make fools at themselves. Oh, that girls could learn not to take themselves so seriously. I have a mantra, do it scared, do it scared. And I try myself and all the staff to lead by example. I play netball against them, I ski with them, I go on the choir tour and try to sing with them. I spent the summer in Tibetan China living with nomads, herding yak and hiking sacred mountains and generally having near-death experiences. All the staff in the school are encouraged to share their lives, their hobbies and their achievements with the girls and themselves to be lifelong learners. That way, the girls understand that education isn't simply a straight tra trajectory to passing exams and getting a job, but traveling along a path of valleys and plateaus and hilltops towards fulfillment in their working and personal lives. It's a varied terrain which brings both exhilaration and pain. By seeing life in this fluid and flexible way, girls will discover that the only glass ceiling is in their minds, in their own heads, in the mental bondage to perfectionism, in the fear of failure, and in their refusal to take a punt on life. So our favorite saying at school is by one of the world's greatest philosophers. And all the girls know that this is my biggest message for them. It's Christopher Robin talking to Winnie the Pooh. You're braver than you believe, and stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think, if you're prepared to take risks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Lucy's very kindly going to take questions and run her own question time. Do you want 10 seconds to swig some water? Oh, all right, yes. <laughs> So we've got microphones, I think. I can't see my microphone people, but I expect they're there. There they are there. So think of your question, and off we go. Who has got the first one for Lucy? I've got one, if nobody, you have. Yes, let me just. Oh, hello. Um, I've been hearing about uh, encouraging emotional intelligence with kids, and I, I appreciate uh, whatever you said. When you go to the corporate world, what they want is emotional intelligence, not the grades. Uh, but then as a parent, like, now how do I encourage emotional intelligence? I expect schools, but then not all schools uh, does whatever is expected to be done. So as a parent, how do I encourage that? So, and especially to a girl. So we're asked, how can we develop emotional intelligence as a parent? you mean. Let them have fun, first of all. Do things with your children. I talked about the bonding memories, the um, going out and doing things with them, with them that they can recall together later on in life. Helping them to take risks. I've been talking a lot about them. With girls, I think one of the most important things as I, that I said was helping them to laugh at themselves 
and not to seek perfectionism, not to take themselves so seriously, and to have a go at things which they may get wrong. We found that although we don't emphasize academic achievement as the sole aim of our school, our academic results and performance is going up and up and up as we build the girls' confidence, character, self-belief, and sense of fun. They see me doing these things that I've just mentioned, playing uh, netball or what have you. I don't do any of these things well, but I do them with a whole lot of enthusiasm and heart. And they see that if the headmistress can fall over or get things wrong, then they see that they can be brave enough to do so as well. So help your child to be brave. We're in a, a risk-averse culture. Health and safety, we heads have to be all over it. But do take them out and climb some trees. And a little bit of risk is absolutely necessary, particularly for an adole adolescent. Hello. Uh, could you address the uh, vexed question of uh, single-sex schools and whether they it is better to send a girl to a single sex, a girls school as opposed to a co-ed school? My fellow head here of Headington School is just thinking, I'm so glad I'm not up there having to ask that. There is no right and wrong and there is no better or best, really. Um, there, are, there is plenty of um, uh, studies and statistics which show that girls achieve better overall in single sex schools. And my colleague Ben Thomas yesterday said, yes, and boys achieve better in co-ed schools. Uh, but having said that, it is horses for courses. Um, I certainly know that in a single sex school that I'm teaching in now, that the entire curriculum is open to girls. And so two of our uh, previous uh, head girls, recent head girls, have gone off to be engineers. Another is working in the aeronautical department of Rolls-Royce. And there's no question that there are girls' subjects, like the fluffy ones, English and history and modern languages, and the boys do the tough things, like the physics and the engineering. Not at all. The entire curriculum and all positions of leadership are open to girls in a girls' school. One thing, though, that I would scotch is that some people say, oh, but aren't girls so bitchy in a girls' school? And I've found exactly the opposite to be the case. Until I worked some years ago at um, uh, a girls' boarding school in Berkshire, my teaching experience had always been in co-education in mixed schools. And I'd found that it, when you get to the adolescent period, that girls are foul to each other when boys are around. And my own younger daughter in particular had a terrible experience in her sixth form because, as I mentioned, she's a tomboy. So she loves sport and she loves joshing around with boys. She knows how to banter. So she got on, got on tremendously well with the boys. You can imagine what the sisterhood thought of that. They hated her for the fact that she was popular and they made life very, very difficult for her. In a girls' school, there's no competition and the girls aren't wasting time Starting themselves up with their hair and their makeup, they can just get on with the business of learning of their lessons and learning about life. And it's liberating. I just wish sometimes they'd take a shower. But, uh... So, how many girls at your school? We have uh, we're what's called a through school. So we have a junior school and a senior school. We have 168 in our junior school and 330, 340 in our senior school. We're constrained being in central London. We're bursting at the seams. We have about 10 applicants for every place. So um, it's a, a smallish school, medium-sized school, I suppose we'd call it now. There are 520 girls overall. So, 4 to 18. Um, can I, while they're waiting, ask you a question? We've heard a lot this weekend about the pressure on places and the timetable for <coughs> applying for a school like yours. Could you just comment briefly on that and whether you also take people in at the sixth form? Yes. Uh, my heart goes out to the parents here in London. Um, I'm relatively new to it, only been here, this is my fourth year now, and it's a brutal and, and hideous scene. So I'm talking about resilience for, for your daughters, but my goodness, you need it yourselves. 
Um, so, time is spent in reconnaissance, my father in the military said, is seldom wasted. So, for you to do your research first before you ever start bringing this to your daughter, because it will unnerve her and frighten her. You do your research um, privately and quietly, and don't bring it to her too early. Um, ben Thomas yesterday talked gave, talk very well about the whole process, and I won't repeat what he said, but in year four, get your long list, in year five, um, be uh, narrowing it down. That's when you should really be going out to the open mornings. We have two next week, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, and the books are virtually closing on November the 30th. The registrations will close for the North London Consortium, which has about 20 L uh, central London schools in it. Uh, so in year five, you get your shortlist down to four or five schools. And in, in year six, you'll go back to those for the second time, probably with your daughter, and you'll see how she, she feels in each one of them. I can't tell you how important it is that you meet the head and you hear what the head has to say and you meet other members of the head's leadership team because that sets the ethos and that most of all, of course, you meet the children. Um, we, at six, we take another very, very small intake, perhaps four or five at 13 plus uh, going into year nine because just a, two or three girls may go off to boarding school at that stage from our school. And then at sixth form, we might have five or six girls who will leave us after year 11, usually go to go to a co-ed boarding school, uh, generally something which I, I would recommend only to our feistiest of girls for the reasons I've just said, and we do have some like that. Um, so into our sixth form will come some girls as well. And interestingly, we're seeing something of a trend of girls from uh, all girls boarding schools wanting to come into London for the sixth form in a day school. I think just feeling they want a little bit more independence, preparation for university, etc. So we do take children into, into the sixth form, probably about 10 perhaps, and we have sixth form scholarships as well. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for your um, full presentation, and I think for a lot of us parents, some of your earlier words about the challenges that particularly young women face um, probably shocked us all, but it's good to sort of lay it out there and at least address uh, those head on. Um, one of the benefits of being in London is, of course, it's very multicultural, and I was wondering um, what it is that's done at your school to use that as a way to bolster um, you know, one's awareness of you know, the world that's around us um, mm. you know, and how that can actually be a strength uh, for them. Yes, first of all, I, I'm so sorry if I've cast a, a cloud of gloom over you all. Life is wonderful, and we teach children, as I say, at our school about joy and about the fun that it, it is to be a child. And we're so thrilled that incidences of mental health problems are going down in our school, bucking the, the uh, trend that we see elsewhere. So it, it isn't all as bad as I might have conveyed. Um, we're in a, certainly a multicultural society, London. We've only got to look around us here and see what a wonderfully rich mix there are of families. And it's a strength for a school of ours, you're quite right, to uh, give a greater global awareness. Um, we uh, um, have uh, many programs within the school that help the children to look out from this bubble. Of course, it's so wonderful that we're here in the center are the cultural center of the world. And we're taking our girls out so easily within just a triple period to all the um, art galleries, museums, and lectures on our doorstep, which is fantastic. We also have the most wonderful resource, and that is our parents, who have been out outstanding in offering uh, work experience and internships and coming in to talk to us about their businesses and their work, which, of course, is all around the world. And so we shamelessly exploit uh, that, fa that fantastic resource. As you'll expect, our Modern Foreign Languages program is outstanding. And uh, girls who are, who, for whom English is not their first language usually take uh, a GCSE in their own subject um, a year or two or three earlier than they would need to. So that they can then go and pick up another GCSE or another language or what have you. Many of the girls in our school are multilingual and they're quite exceptional. They speak flawless English and flawless Italian, Spanish, and goodness knows what. Hello. Hi, here. Yeah. Hello. Um, my daughter wants to, um, she says she wants to be an actress. Um, she's 10 years old. Um, do you think you should, as a parent, uh, it's better to put the kid in an academic school or um, performing arts school? 
I think at the age of 10, I'd say keep her life as normal uh, and as happy and as stress-free as possible. Um, you'll find every good school, including ours, of course, gives great emphasis to the performing and creative arts, uh, some, somewhat in, the, in defiance of the government's increasing drive to narrow the curriculum and focus just on what they call hard academic subjects. Uh, but there's never been a greater need for developing our children's imagination and creativity. We set great emphasis on it. Um, but I wouldn't say that there is either an academic school or a school that majors on performing arts. There are, of course, specialist schools like the Brit School. But we here are, are at Francis Holland, our academic um, side of our school is absolutely thriving. But as I say, it's not because we're beating the, head, the girls about the head over their studies, but because we're developing their strengths, their resilience, their opportunity to act, to sing, to play, to dance. Uh, our ballet is with the foremost uh, school actually in London in ballet, for example. Uh, so they'll have tremendous opportunities. Um, so I wouldn't too early push your child off. At the age of 10, isn't it a wonderful strength of girls that they are often so articulate and so confident and so expressive. Picasso said all children are born artists. The difficulty is remaining an artist when we grow older. So nurture her confidence because perhaps if she went into a specialist environment too soon, rather like going to Oxford and finding everyone has 12 A stars, that might also be the case um, at, a, at a specialist school. Um, and uh, some schools, for example, ours has an actor in residence. So we have you know, the influence of uh, actors and um, uh, professionals who are coming in from the world of theater to support the, the girls. Suddenly, suddenly a forest of hands. Um, I very much appreciated what you were saying about emotional development and intelligence in girls. And I'm here as a mother of a, a very sensitive and neurotic eight-year-old. And I'm quite concerned about what will happen to her when she goes on to secondary school. I also have a friend, a very close friend, whose teenage daughter has recently been absent from school for some time with anorexia. Um, my son is at a London day school and amongst the parents who also have daughters I've heard people talk about different girls schools in terms of which ones have more or fewer incidents of anorexia now that's not a statistic that's published in the academic league table no it doesn't go in our prospectuses and does it? no and so what I'm particularly interested in knowing, and I'm, I'm sort of seeing this through the eyes of my friend whose daughter is at a very successful uh, girls' day school and, and, and so sadly, is, is currently very unwell. How can I know from the outside when I go to choose a school for my daughter which is going to be the least likely? Where, where is she going to be? How, I mean, I'm very impressed by the way that you speak and I, I've been to your open day already and I noticed the atmosphere in your school, but there are a lot of other day schools and we should be visiting them. So how, how am I going to, to tell? You would certainly hope that a headmistress would be honest or a head teacher would be honest about the incidents, incidences of mental health problems, in particular anorexia, but actually self-harm cutting and this sort of thing is very prevalent amongst girls. Um, you can only ask her and ask any other parents and children who are at the school. I would be absolutely straight up with the number of instances that we have. Um, we monitor it very carefully because our Place to Be program is very much data-based, evidence-based. And so the, the, the girls do questionnaires. We um, you know, look at the numbers of, uh, of exactly what you're talking about and over time monitor whether these instances are going up or down. So we can tell you, and I can tell you, that the incidences at our school are going down and that does uh, buck the trend nationally and particularly in London. There are apocryphal stories of the problems in certain schools um, and, I, and I wouldn't like to comment on any individual school but I would only refer back to what I've said, that girls seek to, do, to please um, and they get very, very anxious if they feel they are not pleasing their parents and pleasing their teachers. Performance anxiety is the single most difficult issue that we, we are facing in schools. Uh, and so you can only get around that by getting them over this fear of failure and getting over them, over thinking that just a B in an essay or coming 20th out of 22 is an absolute disaster. It's simply a work in progress. 
So it seems to me, actually, from what you're saying, that the incidence of mental health problems in a school should be something that schools are publishing, perhaps in boys' schools and in girls' schools and in co-educational schools. Hmm. I think it would be, probably in this day and age, one of the most useful uh, um, uh, pieces of evidence that they could publish. I think that's true, but I'm sure we'd never be able to do that, much as I would be perfectly proud to talk about that. But I think you, you, you know, look that head teacher in the eye and say, tell me honestly, how many incidents have you have? And I know that certain schools, uh, some schools that, that are known as being very academic, have reacted in the last two, two years uh, very strongly and have brought in teams of counsellors. My only concern is that that is the plaster on the cut, both physical and emotional. And that's why we seek through Place to Be and a, a number of other things to help girls to manage their own anxiety so that they don't get to that point of needing a counsellor. We have counsellors as well, but if they can handle their stress, if they learn that to talk about mental health issues is perfectly fine, Place to Be has a drop-in centre. They can go at lunchtime with a friend or by themselves, break time, and just talk about what's worrying them before it gets to being a terrible issue for them. Hi. Um, I thought that was great. Um, I have a question. When you say that um, uh, girls uh, uh, want to please and they're perfectionists. Um, is that because they're born like that or because they're conditioned like that from their parents or from the people around them? And that, I guess, in the, part, the second part, if it is conditioned, <coughs> then what, what ways do you, do you fix it? Is it that you let them fail and see that they're still, you still love them? Or what, yeah. Hmm. I, I'm not a scientist, I'm an English graduate, but I have read that there is a certain profile, a type of girl, a personality type, who is more likely to develop something like anorexia, which is a symptom, perhaps, of that perfectionism. There is also evidence that certain types of mental illness, like anorexia, is genetic. So if you yourself have suffered from anorexia, it is more likely that your daughter might struggle with the same issues. So that's there. But nurture the environment in which she's brought up in, I think there's absolutely no doubt that um, we can create uh, in our daughters greater anxiety which drives them um, to be more perfectionist. Uh, and I said earlier, it's partly in our culture that for some reason we immediately start saying this good girl thing. And so we encourage girls to get that lovely emotional stroke and go for it again. And your daughter's sitting there and I bet she loves to hear you being pleased with her. And as a mother of girls and boys, it is extraordinary how boys really couldn't care less that much. Of course, I'm speaking in huge generalities, and I've heard some psychologists say there's a Venn diagram, and there's the 20%ers in the middle, those tomboys, who think more like boys and aren't so bothered about approval and that sort of thing, that, that they are a little bit more naturally resilient. But I think, I mentioned earlier about this hot house of London and the anxiety that, that you yourselves must be feeling, and I quite understand it. But somehow we've got to try to shield our, our children from that. Maybe you'll think, oh, we mustn't shield our children from the reality, realities of life. But they don't need to know about it at three. They don't need to be tutored when they're three and being made to feel that they're not doing their numbers as well as Susie over there is doing them. Why aren't you able to count to 20? And it puts terrible pressure on them. Uh, and I wish that childhood was longer, and it can be longer if you yourselves have fun and make time to be with your children. Very hard. Two of you are working and desperately trying to pay the bills, let alone the school fees. Um, but we can try to make our homes a place uh, of joy and happiness and as little stress as possible. And goodness, learning to laugh and not take yourselves too seriously is a good step on that path. Yes? Uh, hello. If um, academics is uh, not purely what your school is about, how then um, do you choose girls? If you say you've got 10 applicants for each place, how do you then go about choosing which girls you'd like? So if we're not, 
if academic isn't our focus, and of course every head likes academic, good academic results, and of course I'm delighted that ours are going up and up. Um, I'm most delighted by the fact that our value added, the amount that we add on to the girls' baseline ability is among the top in the country. But that said, we are in this brutal regime, and my school is part of something called the North London Sc uh, Schools Consortium, which is about 20 schools that organize together an 11 plus exam in English and maths. And it enables girls to sit for all those schools and only take one exam. Well, actually they have to take two because the 20 schools organize into group one and group two, 20 or so in each. One exam for that and one exam for that group. And yes, it's a, um, uh, an exam in maths and English. But I am so interested in the contextual data around these children. And I don't want a school, nor a world or society, where everybody is just a brain on two legs. And as I look to the future, and I see um, us living in this technologized society, and digital learning, and creativity, and enterprise being the way forward, and new jobs that we've never heard the names of yet appearing, I want to prepare girls, and all children, for that future. And just an, uh, an exam in maths and English won't tell me whether the, um, that child has got what it takes and will benefit from our broad, stimulating co-curriculum as well as our uh, curriculum. We have over 60 clubs and societies in our school. So I spend hours, days, weeks. In fact, I spend um, two long, long weekends shut up in, in uh, my house just reading through all those heads references all the contextual details, the baseline data, the exam certificates, the letters, everything that will tell me more about that child. Because I don't want to miss some gem, some treasure, who perhaps really bright, but has a particular difficulty with equations or can't manage to get through her um, creative essay in the 11 plus fast enough, but is wonderfully creative and resilient and musical and sporty and everything too. I want all these different girls in my school. So against their exam results on my enormous spreadsheet, I have all these other columns which tell me other things about the girl and I try to balance it out. Now I can't tell you whether every head teacher does that. I can only imagine that in some of the bigger schools they simply can't. Uh, but I do do that, and it's really important to me. I couldn't live with myself otherwise, particularly having had four children who themselves have struggled to learn. Um, and so I don't want to miss, the, as I say, these treasures. We could have one more question, if there's quite a quick one, but I think we've taken so much of Lucy's time. That, is, there any, uh, um, is there anyone at the back? No? Yep, there's one there. We, sorry. Hello, and thank you very much. Um, you talked about earlier about 11 plus, but how about the um, sixth form? Do you? Uh, we do have, how do you get into the sixth form? Yes. We have a sixth form uh, exam in November. We've just, just taken place. We have a sixth form scholarship, an academic one, as well as drama, uh, music, and art. Um, and that's advertised on our website. So for our intake next September, the exam process has just happened. Uh, and we also have a program of bursaries for children who can't afford our school. And that's something that we're certainly seeking to develop in all sorts of ways as well. So yes, as I say, girls are coming, particularly from boarding schools. Uh, we, parents are always trying to get their sons into our sixth form as well, which I'd love, but haven't been able to persuade the governors yet. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank, you thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. I don't think we can let Lucy go without commenting on the fact that she says that enthusiasm is the cornerstone of her philosophy as a head, and doesn't that come across? Thank you very, very much. Thank indeed. you very much indeed.